So my name is Bill Brown, for those of you don't know me, I'm field sales journalist with Growmark, and uh, we've been working on the custom training sessions for quite a few years. Barry Hanna, uh, most of you remember Barry, <laughs> he, uh, he has a new position now uh, as head of human resources, and uh, but he kind of got the things going, and he's worked with Helmet for quite a few years, and we just carried on, and, and uh, been doing that for uh, for quite a few years. So, uh, so. so first on, we have Jim Reese, talking about... <coughs> Spray drift, and then we'll go back and we'll do the spray issues after uh, Jim's presentation. Well, first of all, I appreciate uh, appreciate you guys having me here today. Uh, just give you a little bit of background about me. Um, I actually started my career as a custom applicator in 1977. Spent the first uh, five, four or five years of my career as a custom applicator. Then I went to work for Bell's Call Chemical, which at that time was the uh, those were the guys who made Bamble herbicide. And I stayed with Bell's Call Sandoz for the, for the next 12 years of my career. And then the last, gosh, from 94 until now, I've been with Precision Laboratories. I'm, I'm actually the vice president of ag chemistry, so I'm in charge of developing in, innovative, effective uh, adjuvant technologies for Precision Laboratories and consequently for Bromark. Um, precision is, uh, we're located in northern Illinois. We're a 50-year-old company now. We, re we actually are have a very really unique relationship with Growmark. Um, it really is a, very much like a partnership that, that we have. Um, we're focused on developing innovative adjuvants, seed enhancements, foliar nutrition, and, uh, and water management technologies. Um, and we're actually the first vertically oriented, uh, integrated uh, company in the adjuvant industry. So we actually are in a joint venture with a 105-year-old Italian company that actually synthesizes the basic molecules, uh, adjuvant molecules, and then we take those technologies, formulate them into something that growers can use. Um, and you'll see, I've got, we're backed by a lot of university and independent research data. Uh, you'll see some bar charts today. We're just kind of geeky guys, so we like research data. Um, and I'll share some of that with you today. See if I can mess it up right away. Oh, okay. So I really, um, Helen was nice enough to show me his spray tunnel out there. It's really cool. I had my first spray table when I started working for Bell's Call Chemical in 1983. I started spraying with with uh, using spray tables to demonstrate demonstrate different spray nozzle patterns to growers because being in the bamboo herbicide business. Did you say Bell's Call? Bell's Call. Remember that name? I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually one of the first sales reps to actually uh, to get to have a, a spray table as a Bell's Call Chemical in 1983. And of course, as you can imagine, with Bamboo Herbicide, we are concerned about drift. So we wanted to help customers or growers and applicators select different nozzles. So I've always been interested in this whole drift thing. And we started working on a project several years ago with Dr. Klein at the University of Nebraska. Um, Dr. Klein had a little bit different approach to drift control. Recognize that? You said Valsicol. Valsicol was the first air one of the first air induction nozzles in North America. And that is one. Very big droplet. The pattern was a piece of crap. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, just, well, we'll talk about that. We'll come back to that. I'll be up So, so Dr. Dr. Klein had an interesting idea, and we were involved in, in the beginning of that research. And, um, but he was also the guy who said, you know, I always ask, well, what is good drift control? And Dr. Klein actually had, had a number. This is not, by the way, the font I selected. Uh, <laughs> So sometimes when you have different fonts, you know, and you move your, your presentation from one computer to another, I'm just, right now I'm telling you, I would not pick this font, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the one on top, that's mine. This one, not so much. Anyway, so Dr. Klein said, uh, he said, what, what is good, good drip control, Dr. Klein? He said, well, really what we need to do is keep the volume of spray droplets that are 210 microns or less or smaller 
to under two gallons per acre. So he actually, Klein had, he had a number in his mind of what he thought good drift control was. You know, so he said, so the percentage thing kind of will mislead you. Because if you're trying to keep your spray volume at, at 210, and his, his theory was if you do that at 210, if you can be under two gallons per acre of, um, of droplets under 210 microns, then that's probably going to drive the 105 micron size droplets, the ones that are really capable of moving long distances. Dr. Klein said that'll keep you under that'll keep you under a half gallon per acre, and that's really important. So, if you look at the percentages, they can be you know deceiving. You know, 22 gallons of uh, per acre. If I'm doing 10 gallon work, that's 20 percent. But that same two gallons at, at 10 uh, at 20 gallon work per acre is 10 percent. So that's why you, Dr. Klein said he always felt better just assigning a real number to it. Um, now there's some problems, you know, if, what happens when the volume of the droplets under 210 microns gets too low? First of all, you say, well, then you're doing a really great job managing drift, but you may be shifting everything to the far other side, which means we're making really big fat drops. And sometimes when we make really big fat drops, drift control is great, but we control can go backwards. So really, Dr. Klein kind of came to the point where he's saying, you know, really optimum volume of, of droplets under 210 microns, maybe in, be in that range of 1.2 to 2 gallons per acre, and certainly we need to keep our droplet, if we can keep the volume of droplets at 105 microns or smaller to less than a half gallon of water, uh, half gallon of solution per acre. So. We have been so interested in this, we're always trying to figure out ways to measure droplets. And how do you actually capture the size of these things? This is actually some technology that the University of Illinois has. Um, so a lot of guys are measuring droplets with, with lasers, right? Well, not a lot of guys. A few really fortunate, well-funded universities get to measure droplet size with laser technology. Um, this is an alternative technology that the University of Illinois has developed. We're actually in a licensing agreement with them on this technology, but they're using high-speed photography to capture droplet size. Um, so they've got a really nice spray table built on, uh, this is actually uh, Dr. Brett Howard's uh, spray table, built on a, um, uh, a pickup box, or a toolbox platform. Um, but And what they've got is an LED light there, and then, uh, the high-speed camera and they're shining or spraying down between the two to get a pattern. The, the real secret in all this isn't uh, isn't the uh, the technology, you know, the the hard uh, the uh, the equipment. It's the software. And the way this thing works is it has a really cool algorithm in there that captures droplets and measures it, compares them to other known shapes and and categorizes them. And what we've been able to do is take that technology now, condense it down, and this is actually what we have in our lab now. This is, instead of that big spray table, we have a spray booth now, so you can see the LED lighting we're spraying down through here, and now we're able to measure droplet size over here and get a, a rough idea of what's going on with that spray pattern. Um, the only thing I'm going to do with this yet is I got to put a downdraft in it because I'm getting some fines. I think I'm getting a little bit higher read on some of the fines. But once I get my downdraft put in there, I think we're going to have a really cool tool to use. To, and then we can do the next thing, which we'll talk about. You got any problem with bounce? Anything coming back up into the camera? You know what? I'm not sure I'm getting bounce. I, I think I, I retard bounce quite a bit with this, but I think I just get some of those ultra small particles that Vortices just kind of, yeah, yeah, got a vortex going. And, so you double count it sometimes. So I think so. Because okay. so, when I reference this against some of the laser data we've generated, a little bit different. Okay. It's, it's all relative, but it's still not <coughs> there. But so you can see we've got this big interest in drift. We actually did a study a couple years ago, and this is what I'm going to share with you too, is that I had this question about interaction, right? And actually, this was based on a conversation I had with Dr. Klein several years before that. Um, so, we usually just think about measuring drift and we're measuring just water alone. But we wondered about, do different herbicide formulations have an impact? 
So what is this interaction between nozzle type, um, the adjuvant, and the herbicide? How does that affect drop droplets and drift? And does it affect weed control too? So we're the first ones uh, to ever generate this data where we overlay drift control and weed control. Again, not my font. <laughs> um, so what we did was we went and we, we used the same nozzles to generate both the droplet size data through the University of uh, Nebraska's, uh, uh, we used their Sympatec laser to measure the droplet size. And we used, uh, we had Dr. Brian Young at Southern Illinois University actually do the biological efficacy work. So we could look at both, both attributes to say, here's what we're getting for drift, but here's what we're getting for weed control. So, um, and then we actually got Brian, Dr. Young to even spray closer to real world conditions, because you know what this is, right? You know what this is? This is, this is how fast most research trials are put on for weed control. This is right at 3.2 miles an hour. This is how fast I used to walk when I sprayed research trials. Do you guys spray at 3.2 miles an hour? No. <laughs> Hopefully not, right? <laughs> On a really bad day. So we got Brian Young to spray the trials at 10 gallon, uh, 10 gallon applications per acre and 12 to 13 miles an hour, so we had a little more real world conditions. So the way the data, I'm going to show you the drip data first. And we're measuring the, that um, percent of the volume that's now over 200 microns. So the way I'm looking at it is, um, I said earlier, I'm concerned about this, the amount or the volume of material under 200 microns. So to me, if it's over 200 microns, it's probably going to be on target. It's going to be hitting the ground. So it's easier for me to think about that. And since I'm doing 10 gallon work, and I said Dr. Br uh, Dr. Klein's ideal number was at two gallons, he wanted no more or uh, <coughs> no less than uh, two gallons or excuse me, no more than two gallons of spray solution under 210 microns. So it's kind of easy math. Two gallons uh, uh, of 10 gallon work is 20%. So really what I want is, I want bars above the 80% number. So if I have, you know, the higher the bar goes up here, I'm at 80, that means I've got 80% or eight gallons of my 10 gallon work in droplets over 200 microns, so they're going where I want them to go. And if I get bars shorter than that, then it says I got more droplets under 210 microns than I really wanted. And that means I'm probably vulnerable to drift. So then we looked at uh, three or four different nozzles, the XRs, the Turbo Ts, the AI XRs, and then the Guardian Airs. I chose the Guardian Air because that's a, a hypro nozzle. Shows up on a lot of John Deere sprayers. Hypo makes all John Deere sprayer nozzles, so um, that's why I wanted to look at that. So here's what it looks like with water alone. So when I look at the XR nozzle, and I say, is the XR nozzle, and by the way, at one time the XR nozzle was considered a drift reduction nozzle, right? Better than just a straight old flat fan. So I say, well, is, is the XR a great drift reduction nozzle? Well, probably not. I mean, gosh, 71% of my, my spray volumes on target, 71% of it's in droplets over 210 microns, but that means 29% of it's not. So 29% is now vulnerable to moving off target. That's not a great number. I look at the Turbo T, and is it better than the XR? Slightly, yeah. Of course, the AI XR, you guys have all heard about those, right? Yeah. Air induction nozzles, wow, look really good. It's really the only nozzle here that, that exceeds the standard, right? So if this is the benchmark, anything above that line would be good. So I'm like, wow, that, maybe the AIXR is the right nozzle for me. But now I've got a question for you. What's going to happen when I add a herbicide to it? So if I add a, a loaded glyphosate like PowerMax, uh, what's going to happen? What do you I mean, mean the loaded? It's got a surfactant system in it. Okay. So this is actually Roundup PowerMax, great question. It's got a surfactant system in it, um, so you don't need to add any additional surfactant. And they, uh, so it's got a loaded glyphosate formulation. It is specifically Roundup PowerMax. How many of you think that anything's going to change? Nothing's going to change at all. 
How many of you think that drift control will actually get better? Drift control could go up. How many of you think that drift control is going to go down? Let's see. Wow. Wow. Oh, holy crap. Yeah. <laughs> wow, when I saw that. See, so some of this stuff, you guys are going to go, I know this. Some of the stuff you're going to see today, you're going to say, I knew this. I knew this. I know when I do that. Part of my whole interest in this actually was with a, came from a group singing a group of uh, applicators like you guys. And I listened to applicators with the same Gromark company from two sides of the county. And one guy said, oh, I use the uh, AIXRs. I get pretty good drift control, I think. And uh, the applicator on the other side of the county said, I can't kill morning glory with those nozzles. I hate those nozzles. We've got morning glory. I use turbo T's. I get good drift control with turbo T's, and I get good weed control. And I thought, how can two guys who have probably between them 40 years of experience spraying have such different experiences? Well, one guy never had morning glory. So a lot of these things, you, I think you guys are going to say, I knew that. I, that's, I've experienced that. This really surprised me. I've got nearly half of my spray solution <coughs> potentially moving off target. Is that going to be a problem for me? But here's what I found interesting too, that the Turbo T, the way that nozzle's built, nothing really changed. Didn't get, statistically speaking, didn't really change. But look at my AIXR. What I thought was really good doesn't look so good now. Why is that? What made it different? Roundup Power Max, loaded formulation, surfactants. Surfactants reduce surface tension of the water, right? So that the droplet, instead of beating up on, the, on a waxing leaf surface, it spreads out, right? So when you reduce surface tension, potentially what happens, or in this case what happens, is it makes it easier to shear when it goes through the nozzle. Did you do any work on different pressures? Same speed, different pressures? Uh, actually, or these were... Pressure? These were all, this was done at 40, 40, 80, 80. So we ran them at recommended PSIs. But you didn't run the AIs under 80? No, but I've got other data where I do. Does it go up? Um, it actually, is, it gets a little bit, it doesn't get, it's not as bad. So it does improve, but it never gets back to where it <coughs> really was. So now, it's really not much different than the Turbo TR. There are only three percent. Yeah. Yep. So now I'm trying to think about what do I do to make it better? Because this is still not. I'm, what surprised me is how much less I'm getting here than I thought I was. And what's interesting is, so these are both air induction nozzles, the AIXR and the Guardian Air. They all kind of, they, all, they perform relative to each other, but they're just not quite the same. And ultimately, I'll show you why I really don't like the Guardian. <coughs> so now, what happens if I add drip reduction to it? Here's the other thing. So FS and Act DR, which is a water conditioning agent you guys use, but also has a drip retardant element to it. It's really a, it's a nice fit for spraying just Roundup or uh, Roundup uh, tank mixes. Um, does a nice job reducing drift. So we're going to pick up where we left off, where we had the, just the Roundup Power Max alone. We said, gee, almost half of our spray volume now, 47.7%. It's moving off target. We looked at a competitive product. Here's something I'll tell you about this, a lot of this work that we've done. It, it defies farm boy logic. Some of this stuff defies farm boy logic. And I can say it because I am a farm boy. So to me, farm boy logic is just good common sense, right? So I would have always thought I take a drift reduction nozzle, I add a drift retardant to it, and I got all kinds of drift control. That would make sense, right? And I'm telling you, it doesn't work out that way. Jim, have you seen Bob Wolf's data? The market yeah. Here? It's the same thing. 11 air induction nozzles, a whole regiment of anti-drift. Most of them made more little satellites and more driftable finds than if he left it alone. Yeah. So I've seen this before by another researcher. Yeah, and actually, uh, you know Scott Bredhauer's work too. Yeah. And I work with Scott a lot yeah. too. So oh. I know both Bob and Scott. And actually, so yeah, so Scott, if you saw what he presented at North Central Weed Science Society, there's a really popular material that's sold as a drip 
retardant that I sat next to another researcher who said, so why am I using this stuff? Yeah. So, and that's kind of part of the message here today when we get, we'll boil it all down at the end. So what I find really interesting though is that even when we took a, a really good drift reduction material, FS and ACT, and we added it to our Roundup Power Max tank mix, I got better drift control, but am I really doing a great job? What it tells me is that maybe the XRs, if I've got XRs in my nozzle box, and I'm worried about delivering good drift control to, for my customers or for, you know, protecting my company from drift risk, or should I have XRs in my, my box, my nozzle box? If I've got them in my, on my boom, should I be using them? No. Yeah, I'm with you. I, it scares me. The Turbo T, what I find really interesting is just the way the nozzle's constructed that it responded really well to the FS and ACT. I'm getting really good drip control there. With the AIXR and the Guardian Air, I think the argument is I added it, but but why? Did it help me? Good. I mean, I'm getting some water conditioning out of it, but did I make any big leaps in drip control? No. So there's this, there is this interaction, right, going on. Um, so just so you know what, where I pulled all that data from, this is how we laid it out. Different adjuvants, all the XRs, all the Turbo Ts, all the AI XRs, all the Guardian Airs. Again, looking at the, the, the droplets that are under two, or over 10 microns, my threshold's 80, so yeah. And this is what the bar graph really just showed you. And here I want less than a half gallon per acre of spray fines under, two, under 105 microns. So that means I want 95% of my spray volume over 105 microns. And I ought to be looking for 95 numbers in this column. And what it kind of shows you is, and then over here what I did, we overlaid the weed control, right? That's the other important piece. Anything with a green number says it was statistically no different than the best treatment in the trial. And anything with a red number says it was worse than the best treatment in the trial statistically. So, for example, if I look at the, the, the FS uh, or the uh, XR nozzle that we just talked about, Max Supreme is something that we don't sell in, the, in Canada, but we sell in the U.S. It, it's a great drip retardant. Is it good enough with an XR nozzle? It's not good enough. Just like FS and ACT, DR wasn't good enough. But I had great weed control. Yeah. And my FS and ACT DR didn't get, you know, this number's not even close to 80% with the XR nozzle, but I had good weed control. So how do I, you know, I really want both. I want good drip control, I want good weed control, and I'm telling you, it doesn't happen that often. There's a lot of combinations up there and really when it comes down to it, the only times I got great weed control and great drift control was here, the Max Supreme, but we can't use that in, the, in Canada. FSN FDR, here, I got good drift control. I got good weed control. They did drop off a little bit on morning work, but all in all, I see a lot more green than red. And then you can see there's sometimes you could make some really bad choices, AI XR nozzles, I see more more red when I move down to the air induction nozzles. That was always Brian Young's contention at Southern Illinois University. He never was a big fan of air induction nozzles from a weed control perspective. So, we just talked about Roundup, right? Oh, I'm sorry, Helen. At the same time that farmers went switched to, in a big way to air induction nozzles, they also started to squeeze the water volume. Mm -hmm. Is that a is that combination in part due to this thing? Uh, hmm. You know, once upon a time we were twenty gallons per acre, uh, but that's a good that's question. A long time ago. Tom Wolf always maintained that if you're going to use air induction, you're after a small target. And you've got a big droplet instead of a lot of little ones, you need more droplets, so that's more volume. So you can get your drift control if you're willing to carry more water and get the kill. That's, are you willing to carry more water? Yeah, there is that, you know, so, and that's one of the challenges now with the water volumes, you can start thinking about um, Palmer, Amarin, 
okay. grows so fast. I mean, it literally grows out of the application window in a day. I mean, stuff can grow easy one and a half to two inches a day. Okay. So you went from this morning, it was you know under a Coke can in height, and that's right at the edge, and by the end of the day, it's outside of that. So there's the thought that I would it be better off to spray, to carry less water and get over more acres and spray in the application window because it's a significant impact when you go from you know from 15 gallon work to 20 gallon work. You don't go to get over as many acres in a day. Mm -hmm. So they, you know it's a good point though. Air induction houses, maybe they do perform better at higher water volumes. Just can we afford to what else can we do? That's one option. 